We are going to read The Revolt of the Evil Fairies by Ted Poston. While we're reading, we're going to take some notes together. After we're reading, we're going to need your notebook, and we're going to make an indirect characterization chart of the things that our main character, the narrator, says, thinks, the effects he has on others, his actions, and the way he looks. The Revolt of the Evil Fairies the grand dramatic offering of the Booker T. Washington Colored Grammar School was the biggest event of the year in our social life in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Oh, that's a mouthful. Let's get some quick context, right? Um, what is our setting for this story? Write this over on the side, right? In terms of time period, the school is named after Booker T., so it's after Booker T. But still old. And no offense, I don't know anything about Hopkinsville, Kentucky. I'm betting this is rural out in the country. And lastly, that hour tells us we have a first-person narrator. <clears throat> it was the one occasion on which they let us use the old Cooper Opera House. And even some of the white folks came out yearly to applaud our presentation. The first two rows of the orchestra were always reserved for our white friends, and our leading colored citizen sat right behind them, with an empty row intervening, of course. Mr. Ed Smith, our local undertaker, invariably occupied a box to the left of the house and wore his cutaway coat and striped breeches. This distinctive garb was usually reserved for those rare occasions when he officiated at the funerals of our most prominent colored citizens. Mr. Thaddeus Long, our colored mailman, once rented a tuxedo and bought a box too. But nobody paid him much mind. We knew he was just showing off, as opposed to Mr. Ed Smith, right, who is rich. He is the rich undertaker. Runs the funeral home. The title of our play never varied. It was always Prince Charming and the Sleeping Beauty. But no two presentations were ever the same. Miss H. Bell Leprod, our sixth grade teacher, rewrote the script every season. And it was never like anything you read in the storybooks. Miss Leprod called it a modern morality play of conflict between the forces of good and evil. And the forces of evil, of course, always came off second best. The Booker T. Washington Colored Grammar School was in a state of ferment from Christmas until February, for this was the period when parts were assigned. First, there was the selection of the good fairies and the evil fairies. This was very important, because the good fairies wore white costumes and the evil fairies black. And strangely enough, most of the good fairies usually turned out to be extremely light in complexion, with straight hair and white folks features. On rare occasions, a dark-skinned girl might be lucky enough to be a good fairy, but not one with the speaking part. It's hinting at our title. A couple notes for us, right? The good fairies they have white costumes. And they are the kids who are light skin. As opposed to the evil fairies who wear black. And our inference here, it doesn't say it explicitly, but we can infer that the students who are chosen for the evil fairies, since they're not light skinned, are our students with dark complexions. There never was any doubt about Prince Charming and the Sleeping Beauty. They were always light-skinned. And though nobody ever discussed those things openly, it was an accepted fact that a lack of pigmentation was a decided advantage in the Prince Charming and Sleepy Beauty sweepstakes. Prince Charming, Sleeping Beauty, were always light-skinned. 
Sounds a whole lot to me like bias. And therein lay my personal tragedy. I made the best grades in my class. I was the leading debater and the scion of a respected family in the community. But I could never be Prince Charming because I was black. Boom, look at this huge thing here. This is the problem in our story. This is our conflict. Our narrator wants to be Prince Charming. He's not going to be selected. In fact, every year when they started casting our grand dramatic offering, my family started pricing black cheesecloth at Franklin's department store, for they knew that I would be leading the forces of darkness and skulking back in the shadows, waiting to be vanquished in the third act. Mama had experience with this sort of thing. All my brothers had finished Booker T before me. Not that I was alone in my disappointment. Many of my classmates felt it, too. I probably just took it more to heart. What does it mean? If I probably just took it more to heart, um, which I'm underlining here, sounds like he is a wee bit sensitive. I probably just took it more to heart. Rat Jointer, for instance, could rationalize the situation. Rat was not only black, he lived on Billy Goat Hill. But Rat summed it up like this. If you black, you black. I should have been able to regard the matter calmly too, for our grand dramatic offering was only a reflection of our daily community life in Hopkinsville. The Yowlers had the best of everything. They held most of the teaching jobs in Booker T. Washington Colored Grammar School. They were the Negro doctors, the lawyers, the insurance men. They even had a blue vein society. And if your dark skin obscured your throbbing pulse, you were hardly a member of the elite. Right? Look at this. Put a little asterisk here. Our grand dramatic offering, the play we put on, was a reflection of the daily community life. Yallers, yellow, lighter skinned. Yet I was inconsolable the first time they turned me down for Prince Charming. That was the year they picked Roger Jackson. Roger was not only dumb, he stuttered. But he was light enough to pass for white, and that was apparently sufficient. Right? If you're inconsolable about something, what does that mean? It means uh, no one can make you feel better. In terms of our boy Roger Jackson, no skills, just skin tone. In all fairness, however, it must be admitted that Roger had other qualifications. His father owned the only colored saloon in town and was quite a power in local politics. In fact, Mr. Clinton Jackson had a lot to say about just who taught in the Booker T. Washington Colored Grammar School. So it was understandable that Roger should have been picked for Prince Charming. Look at this, right? So what do we got? They're rich, they have leverage, and so what do they get? Favoritism. So we got this problem. It's going to get worse. 14. My real heartbreak, however, came the year they picked Sarah Williams for Sleeping Beauty. I had been in love with Sarah since kindergarten. She had soft light hair, bluish gray eyes, and a dimple which stayed in her left cheek whether she was smiling or not. Oh, Sarah. Of course, Sarah never encouraged me much. She never answered any of my fervent love letters, and Rat was very scornful of my one-sided love affairs. 
As long as she don't call you a black baboon, he sneered, you'll keep on hanging around. A poor guy and his unrequited love is unreturned to him. After Sarah was chosen for Sleeping Beauty, I went out for the Prince Charming role with all my heart. If I had declaimed boldly in previous contests, I was a matchless now. If I had bothered Mama with rehearsals at home before, I pestered her to death this time. Yes, and I purloined my sister's can of Palmer's skin success. So, notice it come out this time. This time is special. I knew the prince's role from start to finish, having played the head evil fairy opposite it for two seasons. And Prince Charming was one character whose lines Miss Laprade never varied much in her many versions. But although I never admitted it, even to myself, I knew I was doomed from the start. They gave the part to Leonardius Wright. Leonardius, of course, was Yaller. I find this a funny word choice. Doomed. Evil fairies. Doom. Good versus evil. The teachers sensed my resentment. They were almost apologetic. They pointed out that I had been such a splendid head evil fairy for two seasons that it would be a crime to let anybody else try the role. They reminded me that Mama wouldn't have to buy any more cheesecloth because I could use my same old costume. They insisted that the head evil fairy was even more important than Prince Charming because he was the one who cast the spell on Sleeping Beauty. So what could I do but accept? Look at these teachers. Teachers. I had never liked Leonardius Wright. He was a goody-goody, and even Mama was always throwing him up to me. But, above all, he too was in love with Sarah Williams. And now he got a chance to kiss Sarah every day in rehearsing the awakening scene. Oh, look at this. The plot thickens. Dun-dun-dun. Well, the show must go on, even for little black boys. So I threw my soul into my part and made the head evil fairy a character to be remembered. When I drew back from the couch of Sleeping Beauty and slunk away into the shadows at the approach of Prince Charming, my facial expression was indeed something to behold. When I was vanquished by the shining sword of Prince Charming in the last act, I was a little hammy, perhaps. But terrific. Hammy, by the way. Kind of means like overdoing it. You're over the top. Campy. The attendance at our grand dramatic offering that year was the best in its history. Even the white folks overflowed the two rows reserved for them, and a few were forced to sit in the intervening one. This created a delicate situation, but everybody tactfully ignored it. Notice, second time, we are brought up um, white-black race relations. Which were also mentioned all the way back in paragraph one. It's something you're going to want to pay attention to in the story. Finishing up this page, when the curtain went up on the last act, the audience was in fine fettle. Everything had gone well for me, too, except for one spot in the second act. That was where Leonardius unexpectedly wrapped me over the head with his sword as I slunk off into the shadows. That was not in the script, but Miss Laprade quieted me down by saying it made a nice touch anyway. Rat said Leonardius did it on purpose. The third act went on smoothly, though, until we came to the vanquishing scene. That was where I slunk from the shadows for the last time and challenged Prince Charming to mortal combat. The hero reached for his shining sword, a 
bit unsportsmanlike, I always thought, since Miss Leprade consistently left the head evil fairy unarmed. And then it happened. Later, I protested loudly, but in vain, that it was a case of self-defense. I pointed out that Leonardius had a mean look in his eye. I cited the impromptu rapping he had given my head in the second act. But nobody would listen. They just wouldn't believe that Leonardius really intended to brain me when he reached for his sword. Anyway, he didn't succeed. For the minute I saw that evil gleam in his eye, or was it my own? I cut loose with a right to, his, to the chin, and Prince Charming dropped his shining sword and staggered back. His astonishment lasted only a minute, though, for he lowered his head and came charging in, fist flying. There was nothing yellow about Leonardius, but his skin. We're getting at it. Nice wordplay here. Yellow here. Leonardius might be one of the yaller boys, but yellow here, he is not a coward, is he? Yellow is often the color of coward. Dis, cowardice. The audience thought the scrap was something new Miss Laprade had written in. They might have kept on thinking so, if Miss Laprade hadn't been screaming so hysterically from the sidelines. And if Rat Joyner hadn't decided that this was as good a time as any to settle old scores. So he turned around and took a sock at the male good fairy nearest him. Settling old scores, right? We have a division in the students. When the curtain rang down, the forces of good and evil were locked in combat. And Sleeping Beauty was wide awake and streaking for the wing wings. They rang the curtain back up 15 minutes later, and we finished the play. I lay down and expired according to specifications. But Prince Charming will probably remember my sneering corpse to his dying day. They wouldn't let me appear in the Grand Dramatic Offering at all the next year. But I didn't care. I couldn't have been Prince Charming anyway. <laughs> I didn't care. Because I couldn't have been Prince Charming anyway. Notice, <coughs> excuse me, end of the story, our narrator is less sensitive than he was all the way back. In paragraph 9. So, in addition to your writing prompts, we also want to open your notebook. And you are going to make your own indirect characterization chart. I actually recommend for this turning your notebook sideways. So let's pretend that this is the top, this is the spiral side of your notebook. Let's go ahead and put today's date, which may or may not be 11-1, and we were writing about the revolt of the evil fairies. Now, uh, what we are doing here is we are creating that steel chart again of indirect characterization. And here's what it looks like. We're going to look for three things from our narrator. We're going to look for things he says, things from his speech. We're going to look for things he thinks, we're going to look for his thoughts. We're going to look for his effect on others. We're going to look for his actions. And we are going to look at the way he looks, his physical appearance. For each of these, we need, I didn't leave myself quite enough room, so forgive me. We're going to have a couple columns. 
we need text support. So these are things we're going to copy directly out of the story. And then we need to explain explanation why our text support is significant. I'm going to give you a couple ideas of places you can go back and look. Um, in terms of things our character says, <clears throat> we don't have any direct dialogue, but we might look in paragraph 24 where he says, later I protested loudly that it was a case of self-defense. Right? Um, you can copy that down. In terms of thoughts, the thing I might encourage you to think about is to find a place, what does he want? Or what does he think about, say, Leonardius or any of the other characters that he describes in the story? In terms of his effects on others, um, you know, we could talk about a couple things. You could talk about how Rat Joiner starts fighting after he has started. Um, after he has slugged Leonardius, or another thing I'm thinking about perhaps is back in paragraph 18, um, it tells us that the teachers were almost apologetic. Right. Um, why is that significant? We might say, right, they realized that our narrator should have been Prince Charming, should have been cast Right, they want to apologize. It's almost like they want to apologize for the fact that he isn't because they recognize that he's not Prince Charming because of bias in the school. Actions. Um, obviously, you have a number to choose from. And looks. Right? What the physical appearance of our main character is very important here. Right? I might look back to paragraph 10, which is where his friend Rat says, if you black, you black. Perhaps referring both to uh, complexion as well as what role you will have in the play. So go ahead and finish this on your own. Um, you can certainly talk to me if you want a little help with that as well. Um, and then you will have some paragraphs to write thinking about how our main character, how our narrator has changed by the end of the story. And also thinking about the, re the, the race relations both within and outside of the African-American community in this story. Hope you enjoyed it. Good luck.